Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages as they come in. In the next half hour or so, we will see what's making the headlines with the consultant editor of the Daily Mail, Andrew Pearce, and the associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin McGuire. Lovely to see you both. Hello. Great to see you. Hi. As ever, though, front pages then, starting with the Metro. Its headline, Sleaze is back, echoing Sir Keir Starmer's comments on David Cameron's involvement in the Greensill lobbying controversy. Telegraph carries warnings from the head of the civil service that senior government officials with second jobs in the private sector must fully declare their interests. The Eye carries an exclusive, they say, about a senior member of the UK's lobbying watchdog, who it claims is a lobbyist himself. The Guardian understands that the Equality and Human Rights Commission believes the implementation of so-called COVID passports would be unlawful because people wouldn't be treated equally. The Financial Times has word of the cryptocurrency firm Coinbase's debut on the Nasdaq share index in the US. And the Daily Star has heard that dairy products are racist, according to climate activists. Extinction Rebellion. More papers still to come in, clearly. Andrew, Kevin are here. To the Metro we start. Andrew, Sleaze is back. Uh, is that true? Well, look, this is um, Labour want this to stick because it's the last thing the Tories want under Boris Johnson. Sleaze was something that dogged John Major's regime all those years ago. Um, it was it bedeviled him. Uh, every other month, it seemed to be some Tory MP was either in a bonking scandal or there was some impropriety and there were resignations and by-elections. Um, but this so far, it, I think the Tories are trying to confine this to David Cameron. Now, he's been gone a long time, five years. But what he did, in my view, uh, uh, he has not does not pass the smell test. In fact, I think it stinks to high heaven. It's completely laudable for a former prime minister to intervene, to suggest to former colleagues that there should be government f financial assistance to try to stop a company going under, particularly if thousands and thousands of jobs are at stake. It's completely inappropriate, however, to do that covertly by texting on private uh, phone numbers. But what's really at the heart of this, Cameron knew if he saved that company, his fortune, his share options, would be worth anywhere between 45 million to 60 million. Even Tony Blair didn't manage that mm. in one deal. And let's mm. face it, he's earned tens of millions since he left number 10. That's why it stinks. Uh, did Rishi Sunak know when he was being bombarded by the former prime minister, how much Cameron potentially hope to earn from all of this. He says these figures are inflated. It hardly matters, Anna. The fact mm. is he was in line for a huge, huge payout and he hadn't broken the rules because he was an in-house lobbyist. If he was an external lobbyist, he'd have broken the rules, which shows the rules are ridiculous. Well, come uh, on to... And, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and so um, it's a mess uh, and, uh, and Labour are going to play it for all they can. Course. Yes, indeed. And, and I'm just going to ask you that general point before we come on to the details of what happens next, Kevin. Labour, clearly a dog with a bone on this one. Not surprisingly, it feels like an open goal. But it's April. There are elections in May. Do they sniff electoral wins from this? Would it play out amongst the public, do you think? I think, I think it will slowly. Labour claim their focus groups are finding out uh, that it is beginning. And with John Major, it wasn't just one event. It was a whole series of events. And we've seen with... Uh, the, the VIP fast lane for uh, cronies of the Conservative Party, donors, friends of uh, ministers who were getting contracts. So it's it's building on on that. And the Metro headline, Sleaze is back. Well, Keir Starmer said Tory Sleaze is back. I think he would have preferred that as the full the full headline. But, but Sleaze is a potential to damage uh, Boris Johnson and the government, which is why the Prime Minister set up the inquiry. I think it's it's possibly too early to have any big impact on the elections in, in, in May in Scotland and Wales and, and across England, various, you know, everything from mayors of the West Midlands, Tees Valley and, and London councils to uh, police and crime commissioners. I think it's too early for that because at the moment the government's getting a vaccine bounce. I think that's probably going to be a, a bigger factor. But it is damaging and it is, and it is corrosive. And look, Dennis Skinner, was kicked out of the House of Commons when he called Cameron dodgy div. I think he probably uh, deserves an apology now, does Mr Skinner. 
Um, so what happens next then? Um, let's go to the FT. The Treasury Select Committee has announced it will investigate this, um, despite Labour's demands for a broader parliamentary inquiry on this, uh, obviously losing uh, in the Commons today. And who gets called? And how interesting does that get, Andrew? Well, and, you know, for a select committee to call a witness, it is almost unheard of for anybody to turn it down because the select committee is effectively one of the highest courts in the land. So Cameron's spokesman has put his head above the parapet for only the second time in 40 days. Significant, wasn't it, that Cameron's statement, two and a half pages, came out uh, this weekend, just gone because of the death, was it because of the death of Prince, Prince Philip who decided to break his silence then or because the Sunday Times had some pretty good stuff about him? But Sunak will have to give evidence and he'll say what he did know, what he didn't do. What, and I think Rishi Sunak so far seems to be in the clear. But the evidence from David Cameron will be fascinating because he'll be caught, brought back to the bar of the House. He'll be given a tough time by Tory MPs too, who will not be grateful to their former leader for any of this. And of course, some of the people on that committee will hardly even know David Cameron because they probably weren't even in the House when he stood down in 2016. But Dave used to be a lobbyist, you know, or a PR man for a TV company called, um, Kevin might remember, was it? Um, the uh, elderly no, it began with C. Michael Green. He worked for a man called Michael Green. But there were many journalists, very serious journalists, who said that when Cameron did that PR job, shall I put it this way politely, he misled them. Uh, he dissembled. Uh, so uh, uh, his whole past is coming back. He is a lobbyist. Uh, and you can see why he's not taken a peerage in the House of Lords, because he'd have to disclose all sorts of details about his income. Uh, and... Uh, and how much money he really did think he was going to make. £45 million is a huge amount of money. No wonder he was sending desperate texts to chancellors, other ministers, and dragging poor old uh, Matt Hancock into all of this. I feel sorry for Hancock, actually. He was a, a functionary in, in David Cameron's office when he was leader of the opposition. So then when he, Cameron calls in a favour when he's Secretary of State, oh, will you come and see this bloke Greensill? He goes to see him, probably doesn't know much about it. Hancock declared everything in the proper way, but Cameron has just dragged all sorts of people into this quagmire. I don't think it's going to sink the Tories, and Kevin's right. It's not going to damage them, I don't think, in the run-up to these local elections, but it's an unwelcome distraction. Indeed, pandemic still being fought, as we know. Uh, Carlton TV, I think, was, was that the one you were trying to... Remember, yes, exactly Andrew, it, yes. Yeah. Um, so to the Telegraph then, more broadly once again, um, um, Kevin, this idea that mandarins have second jobs, which I think just surprised many, many commentators, um, and they're all being sort of flushed out, are they? Is that, is that the plan? Yeah, Simon Case, the uh, cabinet secretary, wants to know who they are by the end of the week. He, he's not aware of it. And, it, and of course, it, it came as uh, something of a surprise to find out the, the government's basically chief procurement officer was double jobbing uh, with uh, Greensill too on his on his way out for several months and then ended up as a director and would have made a lot of money too if the company hadn't uh, hadn't collapsed. It's a bit like a, it's a bit like Harry Kane playing for Spurs <laughs> and then he's going to sign for Manchester United and then he's playing for them as well at the same time. It's astonishing because you're, you're in government, you're purchasing services. You shouldn't then be working for a company that's selling those services. It, it's, it's utterly ludicrous. Now, that's a, that's a kind of structural problem that has to be fixed as, as well. It's not, it's not just dodgy Dave, as we should just call Cameron uh, now. Uh, it, it seems to be rather, rather wider than that. But I could see why... The Prime Minister doesn't want uh, a wider parliamentary committee, as, as we've just heard. There'll, there'll be the, the Treasury Committee will grill uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, the Public Accounts Committee, and all the Public Administration Committee uh, may grill David Cameron. But once you get these wider inquiries, Boris Johnson will know he will lose control, which is why he wants his own inquiry by the lawyer with the with the cabinet office so it doesn't mean to say he'll publish it all and act on it all if it comes along so what happened with the pretty patel bullying uh row he, uh, he basically lost his uh, his advisor on the ministerial code because he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't act on that but it's uh, it's it's amazing how these things blow up but it's taken 
five or six weeks of pretty good journalism by the FT and the Sunday Times to to get this far. And I and I, I agree with Andrew about it was wasn't it remarkable that seventeen hundred word statement from David Cameron he broke his silence of thirty days or so just after the Duke of Edinburgh's died. He knows there would be less attention. Some of the oxygen of, of publicity would have been taken away by the royal royal funeral. Yeah. He's a pig on man at the end, is dodgy dear. Can, can I just ask a question there. though? If he hadn't been, if he hadn't stood to personally gain, would this have all been all right? Do you think? Is the, is, is the difficulty the money that could have been made with the saving yeah. of a company? Is that so? Yeah, so you're suggesting definitely. that prime ministers should be able to lobby, and you know that the idea of banning well, them from lobbying forever, and they go make money on speaking engagements uh, in America. Well, what, what, I, what I would say about that, it's entirely in right for a former prime minister to get involved in trying to save a British company that might be going under. Uh, but it's the way you do it. You should not be using your private phone system uh, because you know the current chance of the exchequer. It, he was doing it covertly behind the scenes. He didn't want people to know what he was doing. Uh, that's not the way to do it. There should have been letters written. He should have been talking to civil servants, not sending little covert texts to his mates, hoping that people would jump to attention because he used to be leader of the Tory party. It really is a grubby little exercise by Cameron, actually. That's what it's been, grubby and greedy. Cameron himself uh, accepts that he should have used more formal channels now, yeah. he's, been, now he's been caught red-handed. But I think it's the money because he was doing it for his enrichment. He didn't show much concern or sympathy for the steel industry and steel workers when he was prime minister. And I think if, if a prime minister, a former minister, was lobbying on behalf of the poor, wanting better housing, and they weren't financially involved, then I think that would be acceptable. If it was somehow altruistic, if it was philanthropic, if it was good charitable works, uh, all areas that uh, Cameron isn't uh, primarily noted for, although in his uh, list of, um, uh, of of interest, he did say he did he did, uh, he did some work. But basically, he's just been trying to make big, big books. And this is a prime minister who imposed austerity, introduced the bedroom tax, made life a lot oh. harder for other people, yeah. and then all of a sudden, snout deep in that trough. I think it's really useful. OK, we really? we'll need, we'll need to get to a break, actually, but um, we will see what happens. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating select committee when it, uh, when it comes. Uh, plenty more from you in just a moment, uh, including a lot of debate over so-called COVID passports. Could they be illegal? Uh, talking about that in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me now, Andrew Pierce, Kevin Maguire. See how many stories we can squeeze in, uh, shall we? The Guardian, first of all, Kevin. Um, this idea of COVID passports and the fact that they might not be legal. Tell us more. Yeah, this is the Equalities and Human Rights uh, Commission. It says that it could be a result of in, uh, indirect discrimination to tier society if there are certain uh, ethnic groups, uh, people of certain economic classes. Who, who don't uh, have the certification to use them. They also say they may be a proportionate response to easing lockdown. So there's a little bit of uh, facing two ways. But this, these are the legal problems that the government has been grappling with for, for some time. As Boris Johnson sometimes seems to back them to go to the pub, and then he backs off from them, and he, you never quite know what he's going to going to do, but I, under, I can understand that, uh, the, the, the concern. But you would have thought if they were really going to be unlawful, the, the commission would have discovered that with lawyers or, lawyers already. I think they're, they're kicking around the, uh, yeah. you know, the, the thing too. And I can, see, I can see there's a problem, but there's less of a problem once everybody is being offered and had the ability to get jabbed. And it, this is it's on the back of today my hancock the health secretary saying in england maybe uh no job no job in care homes where something like uh, one in five of staff uh, are still to be jabbed not all of them will have refused but a fair proportion or will have said no for various reasons just quickly andrew did, I mean, did you want to come in because i want to get just to the very next quickly on that my my view about these passports look i think they're going to happen i think they're inevitable mm. i think they're an economic it'll be driven by economics nightclubs, theatres, those sort of things, they're going to do it. I've always been very wary of the government imposing an, a mandatory passport for those very reasons that the Commission have mentioned. 
don't like the idea of the government being nanny state, telling us what we can and can't do again. And it's going to throw up legal challenges. So, But I think they are coming. And I think the Commission should make its mind up. Um, quick 30 seconds, Andrew. I'm going to stay with you. No point talking to the Republican on this one necessarily, which is the photograph of uh, the Duke of Edinburgh with seven of his great-grandchildren, Balmoral 2018, and the decision, uh, the paper reporting and elsewhere, uh, that uh, about the dress code for Saturday, which has been, I know, something your paper's been pursuing. We have. Look, this is a story that's very interesting. Prince Harry was determined to wear his military uniform. He was a soldier who saw active service in Afghanistan, but he's not a soldier anymore. He's lost all his honorary roles with the military because of his decision with his wife to walk away from his royal duties. Prince Andrew still has honorary roles. So does Prince Charles. So does Princess Anne. They'd all have been in military uniform. He'd have been the only one who wasn't. Prince Andrew, by the way, wanted to wear the uniform of a rear admiral because he's an honorary one of those, which isn't quite appropriate. So the answer apparently is going to be none of the mourners will wear military uniforms. And I think that's very sad because the one person who had a genuinely, really big military career there was Prince Philip, who was mentioned in dispatches in the Second World War. He had a stellar career in the Navy and he would have liked, I think, his sons to have been wearing military uniform. But this is what's happened. Prince Harry's still causing waves even now. Kevin, I was going to do the weather, but I've run out of time. I don't even have time to hear what you're going to say. He's lost for words. No, he, he's he, lost he, for he words. His eyes. It's definitely time to go. Lost for words. <laughs> oh, the, no. whole, the whole royal family is about posing, isn't it? If you if you've got a it's rant, a funeral, wear the uniform. Kevin. A lot of people really want to watch it and and pay tribute. Um, we'll Fancy see you at half dress. eleven. You can talk about it then. Thank you both very much indeed. See you soon.